think they are under surveillance on right. guard by the LGC. <clears throat> All right, you ready? Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and we welcome you to our August meeting of the Randolph County Board of Commissioners. We are uh, moving right along through the summer. I mean, uh, thank all of you for joining us tonight. We have some special recognitions to take care of, and as far as business, one of the shortest agendas that we've had in quite a while. And uh, doesn't mean they're not important, <clears throat> not necessary, but just all, not a whole lot of individual issues for us to, uh, to consider tonight. I do want to mention that Commissioner McDowell is not with us. He's home recuperating from hip replacement surgery. He's doing very well. Uh, told me he's just taking a few aspirins a day, no, no real heavy painkillers. Uh, but since we had a light agenda, and in light of all those steps out there, he decided he would stay home tonight, and I think he might be watching us as, as we open our meeting. So uh, we miss having him with us, and we are grateful and thankful for uh, the progress that he's made and uh, look forward to having him back next month. So uh, with that, we welcome you again to our meeting tonight. Um, trust that you're having a good summer, safe summer, uh, and enduring the heat as best you can. Uh, Reverend Michael Trogdon is with us tonight for our invocation. And for some of you that might not have followed recent uh, meetings and events, uh, Michael will be one of the board members for our new owners at the hospital. So uh, we're glad to have him here. He's been an important part of our community and uh, I know that he will uh, represent us well in, in that regard as he joins uh, Commissioner Allen and myself and others on the hospital, Randolph Hospital Board of Trustees. So Michael, if you'd come forward, have our invocation, and after that we'll have our Pledge of Allegiance. Will you please stand? So, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we thank you this evening, God, for your goodness. We honor you, Lord, for your mercies and for your grace. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the privilege to live in a county such as this. We thank you, Lord, for our commissioners who governs the welfare of this county. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would rest in this meeting tonight. Grant them wisdom. Undergird them with your strength and your grace. We thank you for everyone that will come to share concerns. And we pray, God, that every concern would be hear, heard and considered. Father, we bless you again for the privilege, and we pray, God, that you would just rest in this meeting, and, God, that you would govern everything that you might be glorified. I thank you, Lord, that your hand uh, is upon this county, that your face is toward us. And because of that, God, we ask for honor and integrity and truth. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we honor you, sir, and we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As I said, we have a couple of recognitions tonight, and uh, we're going to uh, ask the supervisors, the department heads, to do that. But uh, I want you to know that these two individuals represent 62 years of service to the citizens of Randolph County. Uh, we have been seeing a lot of that lately. Uh, long-time employees of our county that are retiring and certainly we wish them the best and Godspeed and, and have a great retirement and good health and enjoy the family but at the same time we're going to miss them and the citizens of this county are going to miss them more than they realize really but uh, we owe them a great debt, debt of gratitude for their service and uh, hard to replace you can't replace 62 mm -hmm. years of experience uh, from our from our county. So, uh, first one up tonight is Melissa Austin, and she's been with us for 36 years in the Randolph County Tax Department. And Deborah Hill is going to uh, get through this tonight. Yes, it is a great honor to uh, be here to honor Melissa. 
uh, as she retired with 36 years of service to the Randolph County government. Mm -hmm. I'm going to uh, paraphrase from Melissa's resignation letter. Billy Chilton took a chance in 1985 and hired me as a temporary employee performing data entry tasks. I was only 19 years old and was happy to be hired. I worked as a temporary employee for several months before being offered a permanent position beginning in July of 1985. I was fortunate to have been trained by permanent, permanent positions, oh, excuse me, before being offered a permanent position beginning in July of 1985. I was fortunate to have been trained by a great staff of people under Mr. Chilton's leadership. I performed duties where needed from the listing department, collections, mapping, and real property before finding my place in the listing department for the next 35 years. Having started as a tax clerk and ending her career as a personal property and bu business property supervisor, Melissa gained enormous insight into the appraisal process from the ground up. Her attention to detail, long hours of dedication and commitment to the citizens of Randolph County made her a valuable asset to our office. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Melissa consistently strived to improve the statewide share NCPTS billing collections program by critically analyzing the software, data, and processes involved. Her goal was to make this system not only better for Randolph County, but for all counties involved. Melissa's professionalism, character, and moral aptitude clearly framed her knowledge and work ethics. Melissa's work was always performed at the high level of proficiency and significantly exceeded job requirements. She accomplished the most difficult and complex assignments with minimal supervision and excellent quality. Melissa's work ethics provided a stellar role and a model for other employees. Melissa didn't just fix a problem, she researched the root of the problem so that it wouldn't happen again. If an issue arose during the annual process, you can bet it was on her checklist for the next year's process to ensure it wouldn't happen again. Melissa documented every assessment process her and her staff was responsible for. There was little documentation provided with our current software when it was delivered. Melissa developed and maintained documentation outlining all assessment processes, issues along with solutions, and the keynotes as well as changes and upgrades to the software. The testing of the new software did not only include uh, making sure that our issues logged had been fixed, but also testing other counties' issues as well to ensure their fixes did not affect Randolph County's business process negatively. Melissa consistently exceeded, exceeded productivity levels. She multitasked beyond, beyond expectations, making use of every moment of a work day. She worked with her staff on cross-training, which made them equally proficient in their production. She knew every task and job description assigned to her staff and did not ask anyone to do anything that she didn't already have the knowledge to do herself. She created a team among her staff and their constant cooperation provided an efficiency that is unmatched to any other county. Melissa's long tenure provided a mass knowledge of our current legacy system, so when it was time for the new software to be implemented, she understood the requirements that needed to be in place for a successful transition. She played a key role in writing our RFP and spent many countless hours critiquing the requirements she sacrificed many hours and weekends throughout the migration and implementation. She readily accepted the changes and went that extra mile to learn all she could about the new software. It was this desire for the knowledge that made her a power user for the NCPTS system, as well as preparing her into the next step in the same role as the NCVTS. Several years ago, Melissa successfully passed the tax admission rate tax administration exam for assessors. She had an excellent working knowledge of the Machinery Act. She stayed abreast of any legislative, cha legis 
I can't even say, changes, and, and how the changes would affect the taxing process set for by in our office. In 2014, Melissa was named the Appraiser of the Year by the North Carolina Association of Assessing Offers. It has been a privilege to have worked with Melissa and to call her a coworker and a friend. We have traveled a lot of miles together across our state. During these travels, we talked about many things, but most of the time the conversations always went back to the information we had just learned and how it would affect our office or how we were going to implement the changes. When Ben Chavis was a tax administrator for Randolph County, he created a motto for our office, providing dedicated service to the citizens of Randolph County. Melissa was that motto. Of all the accomplishments Melissa has tackled over the 36 years with the tax department, her greatest accomplishments was a personal one, one in battling and being a survivor of breast cancer. Melissa is married to Brad Austin. Together they have a son, Ethan, and a daughter-in-law, Amber. Melissa and Brad live in Richfield and attend the Kendall Baptist Church in New London. <clears throat> she enjoys an active lifestyle of gardening, fishing, and lounging on the beach, playing with her dog, Bella, and hopefully a grandchild in the near future. No pressure, Amber. <laughs> to say Melissa leaves a huge void in our department is an understatement. She's not just 30 years of experience and knowledge, but also a friend, a mentor, and a piece of our heart as well. Melissa. appreciation that we as a board, that the, the co-workers and the citizens of this county have for you and the work that you've done. So it says in grateful appreciation to Melissa Austin in recognition of 36 years of service, August the 2nd, 2021, Randolph County Board of Commissioners. God bless you and enjoy your retirement. Okay, our next one is Danny York, who's retiring from uh, our building inspections, and David Bryant's gonna roast him. <laughs> Good evening, commissioners. Now, I won't, I'm not as long-winded as <laughs> that other speech, but I'm gonna be short and sweet. Um, Danny was born in Randolph County in 1953, where he's been a lifelong resident of this county. He, he was one of the first or second classes that graduated from Eastern Randolph High School in 1971. After, the, after that, he enlisted in the United States Army and served honorably um, from 1972 to 1975. Danny worked for several plumbing contractors when he got out of the military and then in 1985 started Mid-State Plumbing, um, where he was owner and operator until 1994. In 1994, Danny went to work for the city of Thomasville as, a, as the inspector. Uh, he worked there uh, for about a year or so, and then he started under Bill McDaniels here in the county in 1995. Danny holds inspector certifications issued by the uh, North Carolina Department of Insurance in building, plumbing, mechanical, and electrical. Um, so he was certified to um, inspect all of those trades. Danny's uh, career in public service spanned 27 years with 26 years working for the citizens of Randolph County. In Danny's retirement, he plans to spend most of his time on honey-do list, um, time with family and friends, along with his brothers at the local chapter of the AMVETS here in Asheboro, where he's been a member for many years. On behalf of the inspections department, and uh, we would like to wish Danny the very best. You know, if you, if you had a house being built, you would probably want Danny to do inspections on it because he's gonna make sure it's right. You know, if you're paying your money, 
Um, he, he may have upset a few contractors, <laughs> but it's the homeowners who we try to take take up for, and uh, that's what Danny's dedicated his time right. to do. Right. Danny, Danny, you want to come up? Thanks to you that I just did to Melissa about how much we appreciate your efforts. I believe you did some work when we remodeled this courthouse. Yes, sir. I think you did, and an excellent job that we enjoy and, and take get a benefit from every time we come in here Amen. and save the taxpayers of this county a lot of money. We want to see it done. Right. It was done right, and it's historic. It's still historic courthouse, yes, and we appreciate that also. Thank you very much. Those that helped. It says, in grateful appreciation to Danny C. York, recognition of 26 years of service, August the 2nd, 2021, by the Randolph County Board of Commissioners. Sincere. God bless you, Danny. I hear from contractors there's plenty to be had. Okay, uh, next is our public comment period. I'll ask our attorney to please read the rules. Yes, sir. Um, the public comment period will be limited to 15 minutes at the beginning of the meeting. If more time is required, it will be at the discretion of the board. Each speaker must give his or her name both orally and in writing. Before speaking, speakers will be limited to three minutes. Comments are to be directed to the board as a whole and not to one individual commissioner. Response, discussion, or action concerning issues raised during the public input session will be at the discretion of the board. Speakers shall be courteous in their language and presentation, and speakers should not discuss matters which concern the candidacy of any person seeking public office or matters in current or anticipated litigation. Madam Clerk, do we have a speaker? We do. Elizabeth Behrens. Please, please give us your name and address, Elizabeth. My name is Elizabeth Michelle Behrens and my address is 635 Far Street here in Asheboro. Um, I'm bringing forth something with, with Randolph County DSS. Um, I'm not sure if you're aware of the corruption at Randolph County DSS, nor the fact that they have continuously harassed families on nothing more than false allegations brought forth by other people. I am currently um, in a situation with Randolph County DSS where the caseworker that had been assigned to my case back in 20... Ma'am, ma can I... If I could, uh, Mr. Chairman, if I could step in here while you have the right to, to speak and we don't want to interrupt that, I would instruct you, it sounds like you're talking about a matter that is currently in the process of being litigated. And so, Not as of yet, no. Okay. I mean, if, 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 if that's not, that's fine. If you want to talk in generalities as it applies to the organization, I just, I would encourage you to be careful Obviously, everything that you're saying here is recorded and it's a public record, and so I would just encourage you to be careful about commenting about either yours or someone else's specific case. Yes, sir. Um, I know as a fact, though, the caseworker in question did have a felony charge of for forging a judge's name in another case where they had taken an autistic child out of the home. And then when it was discovered that it was a forged um, signature from a judge, the person in question was still kept as a caseworker in Randolph County. Um, I know many times that Randolph County has not helped people in trouble. They have left children in situations where they did not need to be with people that were doing drugs, were beating them, things of that nature, but will investigate families where either there is an autistic child or a child in general that is disabled the family somehow has a person that is disabled and they will go out of county purposely in order to take these children and 
nothing ever seems to be done in that case. I do believe that Randolph County DSS should be investigated for their corruption mm -hmm. and for the fact that they really do not do what they claim that they're going to do in terms of helping families. They will leave people where they're in a situation where they're asking for help and they are being told, well, you're married, either leave the man or get over it. They don't say, well, go to a shelter, they don't help them. But then the minute these people get out of those situations on their own, go back to work on their own, find people that will help to watch their children, that's when they wanna come and take children out of homes and tell these families, you can't do it this way. And they cause more problem than there is any help. Is there anything that can possibly be done to actually overhaul that whole situation? Well, obviously you're, you're bringing situation or comments to us that we've heard for the first time. Now, Commissioner McDowell, who is not <clears throat> with us tonight, but I do think he is, <clears throat> he is watching. He represents our board on the uh, social services board. So uh, we will make notation of your comments here this evening and uh, see through legal advice, see what, what actions, if any, we should take. All right, thank you, sir. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Is that it? All right. Thank you. Mm. Next is our consent agenda. I'm going to uh, ask Commissioner Allen item D. Uh, we're going to pull that, and I'm going to let him explain the issue here for us. Yeah, uh, we'll, we'll uh, vote on that in, in September. I got a call from Victoria Whit, who's the CEO of Sand Hills, uh, in regards to these board appointments. Uh, one, uh, Michael Ayers is uh, to be appointed as the Consumer and Family Advisory Committee uh, representative. And that committee has to meet prior to us appointing him, and they meet on August the 17th. So uh, we'll <coughs> confirm him uh, next month. Same thing, with, uh, similar to mm -hmm. Ann Shaw, she will, uh, there's certain requirements have to be met by the, uh, by the state, and so they are investigating, making sure that um, She's good to go as far as uh, holding a board position uh, based on a, you know, various and a sundry qualifications, uh, uh, finance or, or some position within the community. So they're, they're looking at that, but they're 99% sure that that's not a problem, but they just wanna make sure it's fine. Uh, the two current appointments are good through, I believe, September. So we can meet at the September meeting and, and take care of that. So I, I was gonna ask, you're okay if, if yours is delayed I, I think I'm still on there through yeah. September. Okay. So yeah, so we can do all three of those all right. in uh, in September. Okay. So item D is removed. Is there another item here that a commissioner would like to um, move from the consent agenda to discuss hope and a uh, regular business item? I would comment on uh, I, which is the sheriff's office carryover funds. Those are restrict, the restricted funds in the Sheriff's Department, and we actually approved that back in April, but Will is just now needing to make the, the uh, budget amendment. So that, that's really um, a part of previous uh, transactions by the, by the part of the board. So do I have a motion on the consent agenda? I move we approve the <clears throat> consent agenda with the exception of item D which will be brought back out in September. All right, we have a second. Second. Thank you. Those in favor will say aye. 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 Those no, and it's approved. Okay, next is our uh, new business items, and our first is the uh, approving a memorandum of agreement with the state of North Carolina concerning proceeds related to the opioid litigation settlement. And okay. Folks, uh this might be a whole lot more than any of us can understand right now, but uh, I'm not going to read the whole thing. It involves money, so uh, and this is this is a result of action that we started four years ago. Yes. Um, so we it's taken four years to get us to this point. Hopefully, it won't take four more to resolve the memorandum of understanding. We, we've really, uh, Mr. Chairman, in, in Randolph County and in, in the state, we've, we've fought two pandemics. One is the opioid, uh, the, fir the, the main one, the one we've all been impacted with so strongly the past year is the uh, COVID-19 
pandemic. But prior to that, we were, we were struggling with another pandemic in our, our county, in our community, in our state, in our nation. And that was the opioid pandemic that was uh, impacting so many lives throughout uh, our county and our, our board of commissioners. I'm gonna mention that briefly in just a few minutes, some of the, the actions that we have taken, uh, which began back in 2018 when the board of county commissioners declared the opioid epidemic in, in Randolph County as a public health nuisance, which uh, started the, and, and we initiated legal action against the opio opi opioid manufacturers and uh, distributors. We were one of the first counties in North Carolina, by the way, to do that. The North Carolina Association of County Commissioners has notified counties that on July the 22nd, 2021, a $26 billion national settlement agreement was reached with the nation's three major pharmaceutical distributors. That's Cardinal, McKeeson, and Amerisource Bergen. Johnson & Johnson had already settled uh, 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 before that. This agreement would resolve the claims of both state and local governments across the count, uh, country. The National Opioid Settlement is expected to bring as much as $750 million to North Carolina over an 18-year period. The state has calculated that Randolph County allocation proportion based on population would be about 1.5%, which totals about $12.7 million to be distributed over 18 years, to be distributed over an 18 year period of time. The Association of County Commissioners has stressed that state and local governments in partic and participating states in, in the country will receive maximum payments if each state and its local governments join together in support of the uh, uh, memorandum of agreement that you have before you. The Association of County Commissioners has advised that if the memorandum of agreement does not become effective, North Carolina's allocation will be governed by default allocations, which will be less favorable to local governments and providing as little as 15% of the state settlement funds and direct payments to, lo to local governments. The purpose of the opioid settlement and the state's memorandum of agreement is to direct as much funding as possible toward opioid remediation. And the memorandum of, uh, of agreement outlines uh, specific high impact opioid abatement strategies that settlement funds may be used to support. That means that it provides guidance to county governments once we receive the funds on the appropriate way to, to utilize that funds so that it is impacting uh, the, the opioid impacts that we've had on the county. Things like strategic planning, collaborative strategic planning, evidence-based addiction treatment, recovery support services, recovering uh, housing support, uh, distribution response teams. Attached in the memorandum of agreement between the state of North Carolina and local governments on proceeds relating to the settlement of opioid litiga uh, litigation and the resolution of the memorandum of, of agreement. I wanna take just a, a second, just a few minutes, to outline what Randolph County has done. Because as I, I was talking with the chairman before the, before the meeting, as you read this memorandum of agreement, it is wanting local governments to put in place strategic planning objectives, to put in place collaboration between uh, the county, the municipalities, with our, our local organizations. And it's amazing how far ahead of that curve Randolph County has really been. In 2017, the Board of Commissioners sponsored a countywide leadership forum on opioid abuse. At that time, it was the largest held by a county in North Carolina. The forum focused on many of the issues that Memorandum of Agreement is asking us to do. The Board of Commissioners in 2017 provided special funding 
to the Department of Public Health to coordinate a Randolph County opioid community collaborative to continue finding common solutions to the addiction crisis. That was in 2017 when the board, you allocated special funding for our health department to do that. And, and what a wonderful thing has gone on as a result of that over the past several years. In 2018, the Board of County, in January 2018, the Board of uh, Commissioners approved a resolution that declared the opioid crisis a public nuisance, and you voted to engage attorneys for litigation against manufacturers and distributors of opioids. Now, I want to mention these numbers again because we, we've been, over the past year, the COVID uh, pandemic, we've been tied up with those numbers, but the opioid pandemic has not gone away. Uh, since 2011, uh, we've had 62,353,767 pills issued in Randolph County. That's 88 pills for every man, woman, and child in Randolph County. In 2017, there were enough opioid prescriptions issued in Randolph County to provide each person in the county with 90 pills. That's why the settlements and the lawsuits that began. The Randolph County Department of Public Health has provided the following updated opioid information, and that's in your agenda packet, and I'm not gonna read all that, but I do wanna uh, read this. The, the amount of opioid dispensing rate in Randolph County per 100 people. Going back to 27, 2017, it was 63.2 prescriptions per every 100 people in Randolph County. In 2018, that dropped a little bit to 53.7 prescriptions for every 100 people in Randolph County. In 2019, that's, that it, it reduced it a little bit more to 33.7 prescriptions for every 100 people in Randolph County. The Randolph County Opioid Collaborative that this Board of Commissioners provided funding for to the Public Health Department back in 2017, it was, uh, has been extremely active and it, they, they sponsor collaborative meetings where they brought together our community partners that had a shared in interest in all this, exactly what that memorandum of agreement is asking all counties to do. We were really ahead of the curve on that. I'm extremely proud of our organizations, our public health department, our emergency services, and the other agencies that have dealt daily with the opioid crisis, even though it did not go away and as we focused on COVID. The, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic overshadowed the opioid ep epidemic and regular meetings of that collaborative, uh, collaborative was suspended during the time when we could not meet as groups, but that's gonna be getting back up. So, so Mr. Chairman, the, the resolution in front of you is a resolution that uh, a, approves the memorandum of agreement that has been uh, recommended by the North Carolina Association of County Commissioners. And, and what that means is as, as a county and then ultimately as a state, that we agree with that $26 billion settlement and that we as a, a county uh, buy into the fact that the money will be distributed in the way that this memorandum of agreement outlines, outlines through the state and, and to the counties. And uh, as I said I was, I, to the chairman earlier, I was on a, a conference call uh, with the director of the Association of County Commissioners and other managers late Friday afternoon. And during that time, the, it was emphasized again the importance of this memorandum of agreement. There is still some, uh, some issues to be worked out with the national attorneys about how they're gonna be paid and where that money comes from, but everyone's confident that will be worked out. I would say, um, I think it was 73 of the 100 North Carolina counties were participants in the lawsuit. We retained our own attorney about, I guess, in 2017. Uh, January 2018. 2018, January of 2018. He will be paid by the proceeds from this settlement. Uh, the offer for the legal, for the attorneys involved is a $2 billion. So th that's what they get from this settlement. 
but 73 counties in North Carolina participated in the lawsuit, but all 100 counties will participate in the distribution of the money. Even though they weren't a part of, of the process or, or, or the lawsuit, they will get based the same share, the, the same allocation or formula as Randolph or Guilford or any other county does. So all 100 counties of North Carolina will participate and will receive funding. I think that comes out for us, the 12.7 for 18 years is about $850,000 a year, round numbers, that Randolph County will get. Now this memorandum of uh, agreement um, requires us to meet certain, follow certain pro processes in order to do that. And I want to read one little caption in here that'll sort of tell you um, part of our process is going to be to find somebody that, that monitors and administers this thing. But this is under um, the distribution, a local government, a local government that has previously undertaken the collaborative strategic planning process described in Exhibit C that wishes to implement a new strategy listed in Exhibit B, but not listed in Exhibit A, <laughs> shall undertake a new collaborative strategic planning process. Um, pardon me, <laughs> you know, Mr. Attorney, but a lot of legalese, legalese in this memorandum of agreement here. Um, but it's been, presented and all the 100 counties in North Carolina are being asked to sign um, this agreement. And no funds will be distributed until everyone has agreed to the memorandum, to the agreement. Okay, comments or questions from commissioners? I, I hate Will's not here because I know he's excited about <laughs> all the qualifications and stuff because this is, this is like the ARP funds on steroids yes, as far right. as the, the number is. of uh, uh, things that you can do, and it's very much spelled out under all those different uh, uh, categories of spending and that kind of thing. And it's a it's a pretty long period of time that it'll have to be uh, taken care of and looked after. So it's not a, just a do it for a year and you're done. It's it's a long term haul. So. Yeah. A um, lot of qualifications and, and restrictions on it. I There's just, a lot of effort to, to prevent this from becoming a golden leaf kind of agreement that uh, has been, was um, placed upon the tobacco companies several years ago. Uh, but how, the use of the money, we can't just say we got $850,000 to, to do what we want to. We're really restricted to how we can use the money. So uh, that's all, all a part of the process. I'd just like to say that um, I'd like to point out that my husband was a pharmacist and the pharmacists of this state recognized long before even the doctors did the scope of what was going on with opioids. And he pushed for us to um, you know, to join this litigation. So um, he was out ahead of the curve on that. And I say that not just about him, but about other pharmacists. So um, if the other commissioners don't mind, I'd like to make that motion. As I think about my husband. So I would like to make a motion to approve the memorandum of agreement with the state of North Carolina concerning proceeds related to the settlement of the opioid litigation and the associated resolution of the MOA approval. Do I have a second to the motion? Second. Further discussion or comments? <clears throat> Those in favor will say aye. 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 Opposed, no. And it's approved. And I'll just make <clears throat> one other comment. I think in the last year and a half, the attention of everybody in the world has been on a pandemic, but the opioid situation has not waned one bit during that process. It's just as real and fatal 
As y'all know, I, I worked part time for a funeral home, and we buried several. We buried many that that died from overdoses, and uh, it is a serious issue and serious for Randolph County. Any other comments? Thank y'all. Next item is a uh, public hearing for the Piedmont Natural Gas Easement uh, at the uh, property that the, Randolph, that the county owns at the mega site. Amy? Um, yes. So as you're aware, uh, Piedmont Natural Gas has requested an easement on county property that is part of the Greensboro Randolph mega site. Um, the requested easement is located on a parcel that is owned by the county and located near the intersection of Julian Airport Road and Crutchfield Farm Road. Um, the tract is approximately 1.32 acres in size, and the requested easement consists of two parts. Um, one is a permanent easement, approximately 75 feet long and 30 feet wide along the Julian Airport Road side of the property for the purpose of constructing, installing, and maintaining one or more pipelines to serve the mega site. Um, the easement also consists of a utility station site easement for the purpose of constructing and maintaining a utility station necessary for the provision of natural gas to the mega site. Um, the utility station site essentially covers the, the rest of the parcel. Um, and you, I believe you have a map of the easement and the easement document in your packet. Um, at your last meeting, you set a public hearing for this meeting. Um, at the close of the public hearing, if you intend to consider granting the easement, you will need to pass a motion approving the granting of the easement and authorizing Chairman Fry to sign the appropriate documents. And I believe that PNG has a representative here um, in attendance to answer any questions that you might have at your request, so. All right. <clears throat> We're going to open the public hearing and if you come forward, come on. On uh, consideration of the easement. Hi, my name is Ryan Halk and I work for Piedmont Natural Gas, so we'd be happy to answer any questions you might have uh, regarding the easement that we're seeking. I guess I had a couple questions. Why, why was this parcel uh, selected and uh, what exactly, uh, 1.3 acres, what's that going to entail? That's a pretty big area for, just tell us what you're going to do. Sure. Uh, so this, this parcel was selected uh, because of its proximity to the future mega site. Um, and the, the purpose of this project is to bring enough gas to that site so that whatever uh, tenant is secured there uh, would, have, uh, would have that infrastructure. And the size that is required for the utility station that we will need um, is somewhere in the range of practically the whole parcel. So generally when, when we take that much area, you, you don't want to be left with a little strip over here, 10 feet or 20 feet. So we just encumbered the whole thing and we'll um, offer to pay for all that. What will it look like? I mean, is it... It's like a substation for a, comparing it to an electrical grid or something like Similar that? Similar to that. Um, there will be chain link fencing to secure the site. Uh, there will be uh, some facilities that come up out of the ground in that location. You know, the bulk of the pipeline is buried underground. Um, but at the end of the line, there will be valves, uh, things like that, that will come up out of the ground uh, so that we can control the gas coming from transmission pressure. We've got to bring it... Um, from, from the west, it's about a seven mile pipeline all the way down to the mega site. And then it goes to distribution pressure. So that's where that transition happens. The pressure is reduced so that we could serve the mega site. And that's the end of the line, I guess. There that's the end of the line, yes, sir. The station is the end of the line. Yes, sir, that's correct. The end of the transmission line, I should say. There, there will be smaller uh, piping coming out of that uh, to serve the mega site. Um, and conceivably, you know, if there's other development in the area which, which may come, it would uh, serve that as well. As far as capacity, how does that, uh, I guess, an end user is going to have 
some something to say about that. Correct. Or, we haven't totally have designed all the specs uh, because we don't know, as you say, the end user and, and what they'll be requiring. We do know the size of the pipe that we will be tapping into uh, to continue the gas all the way down here, and that is a 12-inch uh, transmission pipe. Uh, so that is our plan, is to continue a 12-inch uh, pipe all the way down to the mega site. Other questions? Thank you. You're welcome. Appreciate it. Is, is there anyone else here who wishes to speak to this matter? Okay, hearing none, we will close the public hearing and come back to the board for uh, action on the agenda item. Uh, the proposed uh, motion would be to uh, grant the easement to Piedmont Natural Gas for the line and for the uh, station according to parcel number listed there and uh, authorize the commissioner chairman to sign the uh, associated contract. What's the pleasure of the board? I'd be glad to make that motion, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Do I need to read that parcel number or are we good for the record? Uh, yes, read the parcel number yeah. into the record. Uh, the motion, as the chairman stated, being referencing parcel number 870-870-6808. All right, do I have a second to the motion? Second. Further discussion or questions? Those in favor will say aye. 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 Opposed, no. All right. Thank you. Okay. Next item is the North Carolina Preparedness Month proclamation. Christy McCorkendale. Good Don evening. Banks. Thank you for giving us time on the agenda. Uh, Christy is going to speak to you mostly about uh, emergency preparedness and, and the uh, resolution, but <clears throat> I wanted to introduce her. Uh, some of you have met her, some of you may not. Uh, Christy McCorkadell is our major over the emergency management division. Uh, people get confused about our department. Some call us emergency management, some refer to us as EMS, some, you know, obviously some are the 911. Emergency management is what some of you may remember as civil defense back in the day. Um, she heads up this division for us, and our responsibility for emergency management is response, planning, mitigation, uh, those types of efforts. And the topic she's going to talk about is the proclamation for Preparedness Month and ask that you consider that proclamation. Uh, yesterday was a, a fair reminder of just how quickly things can change and create a disaster as storms popped up and took out Franklinville, Ramsour, Coleridge, Erect, and then left. Uh, she spent most of the day yesterday taking pictures of downed trees. We had five homes damaged by trees hitting their homes, uh, and it went just through that area. I was at the office yesterday when this came through. It sprinkled for a minute, and the wind blew a little bit. But in Ramsford and Franklinville, they have quite a bit of, uh, and down through Coleridge and Erect, they have quite a bit of damage. So I'm going to let her speak to you about that. Chris. Good evening, Commissioners, Mr. Chairman. I'm thankful for the opportunity tonight to come before the board and promote August as the Preparedness Month. Governor Cooper declared August as North Carolina Preparedness Month uh, last week. Um, again, my name is Christy McCorkadale. I serve uh, the county as your emergency management coordinator. No matter where you live, you are subject to disasters. Natural and man-made disasters affect everyone and can cause severe damage and endanger lives. Hurricanes, tornadoes, earthquakes, landslides, wildfires, hot or cold spells are all natural disasters that can be deadly to people and property. Man-made disasters such as terrorism, crime, power outages are just as terrifying as natural disasters. Preparation is essential for the safety for you and your family, both the board and our county. It can also ensure Valuable personal possessions are taken care of properly before you lose them, if you might lose them. Police, fire, and EMS may not always be able to reach you quickly during a, an emergency or a disaster. The most important step you can take in helping your local responders is being able to take care of yourself and those in your care 
The more people who are prepared, the quicker the community will recover, and recovery is the ultimate goal when disaster strikes. Depending on the type of emergency, you may need food and water for a few days. Food that is easily stored and prepared is critical during a disaster. Domino's is not always open. It was last night when I didn't have power, but it's not always open. When disaster strikes, you wanna make sure that your family has water to last for a specified duration of time. It is recommended each family member have one gallon of water per day to remain hydrated, hydrated alone. That's not if you're on a well, that's not able to flush the toilet or take a bath, that is just keeping hydrated. Having proper eating utensils, a small stove that runs off propane, and a grill for cooking, and I will specify there that grills should not be used indoors. Matches, candles, blankets, extra clothing, or a few items to pack away in, in, in a safe, accessible place. Don't forget family activities. Pack some games or playing cards too. Having things for children to do will keep their minds at ease during what can be very scary times. Practice, practice, practice. Every one of us has participated in a fire drill at work or at school through our entire lives. However, when's the last time anyone held a fire drill at home? Do your children know how or where to exit the house in case of a fire? Have you discussed or practiced different scenarios, fires in different rooms, different exits of the home? It may be silly or inconvenient at times, but disaster can strike at any time and you would want your family prepared. Make sure your insurance policies are up to date and that you understand each policy. Have your insurance company's phone numbers handy so you have access to them when and if you need to call. Your insurance companies are a great resource for information on how to prepare for both your property and your family. Insurance companies encourage families to prepare for disasters because it makes their jobs easier once the emergency is over and it gives you peace of mind that you've been covered correctly. This August, as your emergency manager, I encourage everyone to prepare and plan in the event you must go for at least three days without electricity, water service, access to a grocery store, or even access to local services. If you've not taken the time to think about how different disasters could affect you, then we challenge you to take the necessary steps to become informed and develop a family plan for such events. These are simple steps that you can take to save your life and maybe a neighbor's. So I come before you tonight and I ask that you proclaim the month of August as Randolph County Preparedness Month. Thank you. All right, anybody have a question? Christy or Donovan? I, I will say I noticed in the, the proclamation there that there was an EF2 tornado. That's about a mile and a half from my house. So it, it can, uh, when you're not at home and you hear that, it can make you think a little bit about that, what's going on. That was also two days after I took over emergency management. Oh, how nice. Yeah, so I remember that well. <laughs> and and the, the, the bad thing, about another couple of hundred yards further north, and it would have plowed right through yes. uh, that uh, large dairy, and it would have been just chaos there. Yes. So it could, yes, have, been, could have been a lot worse. Yeah. All right. Do I have a motion? I'll make a motion that we... Uh, adopt a proclamation declaring August is Preparedness Month in Randolph County. Have a second. Second. Thank you. Thank you for presenting. Thank you. Yes, Those sir. in favor Thank of the motion you, will say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Donovan. Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Okay, Donovan, you've got the next two it's items. It's still me. Uh, I appreciate uh, y'all allowing us time on the agenda, like I said. Before, um, this request is to purchase I think the ambulances are first, isn't that right? Yeah, to purchase two ambulances. Um, and I will make a correction on the memo. It's They're gonna be 2021 uh, models instead of 2022 because of the uh, Ford. You know, they, they haven't gotten the 22s out, so they'll be new 2021s. Uh, pursuant to General Statute 143, 129, subsection E and three, which authorizes the county to participate in a competitive group purchasing program, I'm requesting your approval to purchase two 2021 Type 2 F450, Ford 450s, 4x4 Tramahawk ambulances through the Houston Galveston Area Council competitive bidding program. The HDAC is a formally organized program like the contract program through the state of North Carolina. The HDAC has competitively bid this ambulance type as required for the lowest available pricing, including associated emergency equipment. 
Other than the chassis year, these ambulance, uh, ambulances will be identical to what we've purchased in the last several years. In comparison to other contracts, uh, including the state contract, Sheriff's Association contract, uh, this HDAC is about 10% cheaper. I'm requesting the board to approve the purchase of two Ford F-450 Tomahawk ambulances for the total price of 489,000 548 to Northwestern Emergency Vehicles up in West Jefferson, North Carolina. They're the uh, authorized dealer through the HGAC and uh, one of only, a, uh, one of the, one of two, I think, manufacturers of ambulances in North Carolina, but regardless. At 244774 each and the funds are already allocated in my budget. Happy to answer any questions. We, we budgeted 500,000, didn't we? We did. And we'll have a couple of things we have to add on there. Uh, we always do in the striping, things like that. But So uh, what about delivery? We go out and pick them up, or they bring oh, them to us. That's a stock item? Um, yes and no. The chassis, they go ahead and pre-order, so they have those on site. The boxes, the ambulance box on the back, which is what the trauma hawk part is, um, that's the design that we prefer here because it allows us to transport two patients versus just one. Um, those have to be custom built to, to the way we want our cabinetry and things like that. Our seating in the back and how many seat belts. I mean, it's, we, it's really customized in the backside uh, in the box. What's the time frame? I know there's a Probably December. December. That's what, yeah, that's what they're telling us right now, but. What? What would be the normal, uh, is that extended out a little bit? That's a normal turnaround time. It's normal, so they're not behind on any kind of... No, that's why uh, normally we get the year ahead model, but that's why we're sticking with the 2021 model uh, on the chassis, but uh, it really doesn't matter. It's a new truck, so right. uh, the 2021s have worked really well, which is what we got last year. <laughs> Other questions? Do I have a motion to approve? I move we approve the purchase of two F450, Ford F450, 4 by 4 trauma hawk type one ambulances from Northwestern Emergency Vehicles Inc. of West Jefferson for the total amount of $489,548 under HGAC contract AM 10 20. Do I have a second? I have a motion and a second. Further questions or discussion? Those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. And they're purchased. Thank you. Um, cardiac monitors. The next is a request to purchase and replace our cardiac monitor defibrillators. Uh, it's been over 10 years since we last replaced our cardiac monitor defibrillators in EMS. This piece of equipment is one of the most important pieces of equipment that our paramedics use on a daily basis for adult and pediatric patients suffering cardiac, stroke, trauma, or other significant medical conditions. Stryker, who does business as Physio Controls, the manufacturer of the LifePak series of monitors we currently use. Pursuant to General Statute 143-129, subsection E and 3, which authorizes the county's participation in the competitive program, uh, this is available on a state's contract, pre-bid, contract number 465, B as in boy. Funding is available in my current budget. Uh, we have reached, researched other models, other brands. Uh, we demoed one that the, some of our employees favored. However, we found that the life pack is still our preference uh, and what our paramedics prefer to use in the pre-hospital setting. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, we are gonna save about $137,000 by taking our current monitors, 11 of those, and uh, trading them back. So there's a discount uh, that is included, uh, a trade-in value discount. My request is to, uh, for the board, is to authorize the purchase of 16 LifePak 15 cardiac monitor defibrillators from Stryker in the amount of $534,869 and to authorize the county manager to sign associated contracts. Any questions? Questions. Do you usually replace these on, you know, every X number of years? Is it a set time period, or do you just His, Historically, know? it's about every 10 years. Um, you know, with it being such a critical piece of equipment and the job that it does for us, um, 
you know, you just start getting a little leery about how things hold up after 10 years. And they're drug uh, all over the place. Uh, they drag them in and out of houses, on the side of the road. Uh, so it's, it's a sturdy piece of equipment, and, and we do pay to have them maintained uh, twice a year. Um, but you just, we feel like it's time we need to go ahead and replace them. And there's some new features that come with the 15s that, uh, that our paramedics can benefit from, and the patients. And, and do you know what they do with the ones that are traded in? They refurbish them and sell them to um, departments that may not be able to afford a brand new one. Okay. So they, they do uh, redo them at a discounted price. Is there a lot of change in features and there are yeah they, and um, I, I don't know that I could could speak on all of them but um, there's a lot of things that we can now monitor that we didn't used to be able to do with the old monitors um, there um, it's always been able to do O2 saturation and things like that but uh, there's a couple of new features um, it does also uh, provide for the new ones will provide for live connectivity or transmission to the hospitals now we can transmit but it's not live. Um, we just transmit. We run a strip, a 12-lead EKG, we run the strip, and then we transmit it. Um, these will have the capability of doing actual live monitoring uh, in the future once we get, get it set up on the backside. Is the maintenance that you mentioned part of this? For the first four, yeah, I'm sorry, I thought I'd mentioned that. It's uh, for the first four years is included in the price? Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, Four-year extended warranty, yes, sir. And I guess 16, does that give you pretty much one on every vehicle, every shift or something? So that you yeah, it's one every truck. Our two um, supervisors, um, our two uh, command staff, and then two spares. Cool. Other questions? Do I have a motion? I'll make a motion to off. Uh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Sorry, to authorize the purchase of 16 LifePak 15 cardiac monitors defibrillators from Stryker for the amount of $534,869. And I also authorize the county manager to sign the associated contracts in this motion. Okay, we have a second. Second. Any other discussion or questions? <clears throat> Those in favor will say aye. Aye. Uh, no. And it's approved. Thank you so much. Thank you, Don. Okay, next is uh, a budget amendment for the supplemental landfill lease collection. Mm -hmm. How we got checks yep. last week. <laughs> One of the real uh, positive things that, that has occurred uh, with the landfill it has been how that lease money that we received has been used to implement strategic planning goals and projects all over this county, from Archdale to Seagrove to Ramsour and just uh, countywide. We uh, received our base landfill lease. It's based on the uh, consumer price index. We received that for $1,112,798. And that, that fund has been used uh, for the last couple of years in our debt service and now it's ready to go back into strategic planning fund, which the board has approved for that to be used. Uh, when in uh, April 2019, the board approved a variable rate per ton over the original 2,000 tons per day. And that re uh, this year we received a, another check for $135,065.43. What this budget adjustment would do uh, with your approval is to put that money in with the other money into a, it's really a strategic planning account uh, we call it health and well-being fund but it also could go into a economic development uh, actions if the board so chooses at a later date all right so the issue before us is to approve the budget amendment to receive that additional uh, variable tonnage yes. I have a motion I make a motion to authorize the deposit of supplemental landfill lease collection funds in the amount of $135,066 into the health and well-being fund available for future strategic planning initiatives. All right, have a second. Second. Motion and a second. Further discussion? Those in favor say aye. 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 Those no, and it's approved. Okay. Um, the next item, I, Hal asked if this was on the consent agenda, but 
uh, I don't know if this is for all you Carolina folks or what. But. <laughs> when I was reading the, I thought, well, if that's the same fellow that's played for state, and sure enough, it was. It was. <laughs> About, I guess about four years ago, I walked down to my mailbox one afternoon and across the street comes this big, tall gentleman and uh, comes out in the street and I thought, uh-oh. <laughs> and he says, uh, I told him, oh, well, he said, well, I'm Alvin Battle. And I said, hmm, same Alvin Battle that played at NC State. And he said, yes, sir, I am. And uh, he married my neighbor. <laughs> so moved in with her and... Uh, We've gotten to be real good buddies and uh, telling stories, but he has a great background. I just, a couple points I wanted to, of course, is the one there, member of the North Carolina State University 1983 National Championship men's basketball team. And I know we've all seen uh, Bob Vano running around the court trying to find somebody to hug, and uh, Alvin was a part of that team. And then, more seriously, down at the bottom, he previously served as a minister for Chatham, and Edgecombe County Youth Detention Centers and the Wake County Adult Correctional Center. And I, I think he'll make a, a great addition to our Juvenile Crime Prevention Council. And uh, so I'm, we're presenting him tonight to be appointed to that uh, JCPC Council. And I'll make a motion that we do that. I would second that motion. Thank you. Be a great addition. Other questions, discussion? Those in favor will say aye. Uh, uh -huh. There's no, and it's approved. Okay. Um, we have um, County Manager Howe. Yes, uh, I wanted to remind the board that there will be a special meeting of the Board of Commissioners August the 30th, and that's to hear requests from agencies on projects for the re uh, to be used for recovery funds, which we have about a little over $13 million for that. We had a meeting with applicants July the 28th. We had 19 different organizations who attended that meeting. And the purpose of that meeting was to provide uh, direction and education on how to fill out those complex application forms uh, for it to be considered for those uh, recovery, federal recovery funds. The recovery funds are there to be directed toward parts of the community that were impacted by the COVID uh, pandemic and it's hopefully to bring them back up to the levels that they uh, were at. Now we expect, we've already received guidance from the Treasury Department, but their final guidance, it will be sometime later in September, we, we think. So at this August the 30th meeting, uh, it'll begin at five o'clock here in this, this room and those agencies will come before the board and they will have a certain amount of time to give you a brief overview of what they're requesting from you. We, we will receive their applications back in my office probably within the next couple of weeks and we'll review those also uh, prior to that August the 30th meeting. You do not have to necessarily make a decision on anything uh, August the 30th. You can take these applications under consideration and make a, make a determination later on should you choose to do that. The, the second item, uh, very quickly, I want to let you know that we re, I received a letter from the state July the 28th, and it's giving final approval for the five, <coughs> five new housing units at the jail. That means our capacity is now officially increased from 211 to 422 beds. We have 242 uh, prisoners, detainees, I think is the word you use now, now in the uh, detention center. Uh, Major Cheek uh, told me this afternoon that they're gonna start moving some of those uh, detainees into the new facility uh, sometime within either late this week or next week as they, they move forward. So that, that's good news for us. And then that completes the first phase of the jail renovation, and they'll begin going into the second phase, which is some updates to the old facility that they, they had. So that I think that's good news. That's why I want to let the board know that. Okay. Anything else? No, sir. Okay. On uh, commission, I, I have a couple items here. Uh, one, I remind the board and those that are here, Dr. Ganey, but. Next Sunday afternoon, the 8th at 2 o'clock, we will do the open house ribbon cutting for the new Trinity Middle School. So uh, 
It'll be a great event. I hope that all of you can join us for the festivities next Sunday. Um, the other issue that I that I want to uh, speak to, and I, I we all got a um, email this morning from Tara Aker, who's our public health director, who's here. Uh, Marty Trotter, chairman of the public health board, is is here tonight also. Um, I think we all thought we were home free on on the COVID situation and uh, uh, the possibilities of of getting the virus, the results of having the virus, the spread of the virus. But it seems that we're not, and I think a lot of that's brought. I'm not a physician or anything. It was brought by this new variant variant that uh, seems to be running amok. But I wanted to make note of some of the comments that Tara put in her email to us this morning. Uh, we've had a rapid increase in all of our metrics for tra trafficking, vi tracking the viral spread in the number of our cases, our positivity rate, and in that situation, our positivity rate, and if you follow some of the comments, they like for it to be five below five. Ours was down about 2.7. And over a period of about 10 days, it's jumped up to 7.9, almost at 8. Um, so it is affecting Randolph County. Our number of um, emergency room visits and the number of serious illnesses that are occurring across our county uh, as we speak. We've had a sharp increase in hospitalizations. I don't have to remind you all, we've gone through about over two and a half years trying to save our hospital. And one of the issues there, there's a limited number of beds. And that statistic causes Randolph County to, to be put in the red because a large, too large a percentage of our beds is for COVID patients. That's just a st statistic, but it's one that is used to, to classify Randolph County in this process. Uh, we've had a sharp increase in hospitalizations causing severe illness, and it has the capacity to overwhelm our health care system. Uh, the majority of our cases are coming from people who are not fully vaccinated. Um, I think the, the percentage that was listed, 94% of the cases came from folks that were not vaccinated. So. Um, her comment was that we strongly encourage that eligible individuals get vaccinated. And I know we don't want to go back to masks. We don't want to go back to mandates and, and telling us where we can go and what, where we can't go. Uh, none of us want that. And we've always let the individuals take responsibility. And we haven't put in place mandates or restrictions except what the state through the governor's executive orders it's done. Uh, this afternoon, I got a little spike on one of my apps that Lindsey Graham today was tested positive for the COVID. He had, had, he had been vaccinated, but he said because of that, it reduced, he only, he only had minor reactions to, to the virus, but uh, we just, we continue to encourage our folks to be vaccinated. Um, to, to take that responsibility, do it themselves. You can call the vaccine hotline at 336-365-6110 and make an appointment. They're open from 8.30 in the morning till four o'clock in the afternoon. So um, we haven't said much about the virus here in the last few weeks or, or months of our board meetings. And as I said, I think everywhere people have relaxed and that's what we want to do so hopefully we can react and take that responsibility and um, and go forward so that we can avoid those things that that none of us like really like at all so that's my comments today um, any other commissioner have any comments you want to make <clears throat> all right that concludes our agenda for today Thank all of you for being here. Those folks that are watching on Facebook and YouTube, thank you. And uh, continue to enjoy the rest of your summer. When we come back, I believe Dr. Woody and Dr. Ganey, schools will be back in session. <laughs>
So uh, do I have a motion to adjourn? Chairman, failure. Yeah. Pardon? Oh, yes. Where is she? There, I see her. Yes. Right. Thank you for attending our meetings very much. All right. Do I have a motion to adjourn? Move to adjourn. There we are adjourned.